in our Code Red series. The past couple of weeks, we've we started off and we talked about having a hunger for God's word and his presence and the importance of having a, a genuine relationship with God and, and continuing to pursue that relationship with God by, by uh, being in his word, by spending time in, in prayer, by spending time in worship, you know, constantly developing that relationship and allowing him to strengthen that. And then last week we talked about, uh, uh, about not building our house upon the sand, but building our house upon the word of God. We talked about having healthy homes and families and the importance of that, not just in your marriage and to your kids and everything, but also to the church and and the ability to for the church to reach people. Uh, you know, we talked about how the, the marriages, uh, the families in the in the home uh, are, are only as strong as the marriages that are, that are represented. And a church can only be as strong as the families that are there. If there's constant chaos and and, and struggles and turmoil, it's hard to, to serve and to reach out and everything when you're constantly trying to, to fix your home and what's going on there. And we talked about how when we build our house upon the rock, that it's that firm foundation and that no matter what the enemy comes against us with, that it will stand and it will not fall. And so if this is your, uh, if you're a, a first time guest, I know we talked about how we're speaking through our core values and stuff, but uh, this is stuff that I believe is applicable in every Christian's life whether you attend this church or not, or whether this is your home church. But if this is your home church, I challenge you, if you missed any of these messages, to go back and to listen to this and, and just allow God to, to speak to you again through it. But today we are going to talk about humility before God and others. And, and just because this is third in the lineup doesn't mean that this is a, a lesser value or that it's least important or anything like that. This is, this, I believe this is a crucial important uh, thing that, that Christians need to, uh, to understand and that it's applicable not just within the church. You know, sometimes when we hear a message, we kind of, uh, you know, think through it just through the, the, the window of what it applies to the church, but also in our homes and in, in our, our job and our work life and, and the, the, what, the way that people see us uh, to the kingdom of God, that uh, somebody that is humble and walks in humility is, is far more attractive and, and easier to get along with than somebody who is proud and arrogant and thinks that they know everything. And uh, so uh, we're, we're going to talk about that. But I think there's just a, a, a humility is something that a lot of people truly don't understand what it is. I think some people think that it's kind of having the Eeyore complex, that you have to go around and, and, and just feel like you are the worst human on the face of the earth at all times. And that you can't ever think that anything is, is good in you or anything like that. And you, you just have to go around just kind of walking. And somebody says, hey, you did a good job today. Oh, thanks for noticing. Yeah. Yeah, go. Yeah. I mean, and you think that you have to be beat down all the time and stuff. And, and that's not what true humility is. And then I think other people think that humility is kind of the other end of the thing where you can't receive if, if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, well, you, you know, you sang good today or you, you, that was an awesome picture that you drew or that poem that you wrote or they, they kind of compliment you. They, they don't want to, uh, you know, act like and, and take the compliment, but instead they, they kind of throw it right back in your face. It's like, no, I didn't do good. Only God is good. There's no good in me, but only God. And, and we think that we're like, oh, God, sorry. Somebody told me I was good. I didn't mean it. You know, I, I didn't say, it. you know, and, and I mean, it's this whole thing. And I mean, how many of you have ever complimented somebody and you thought that you like persecuted them or something by their response. Like, I'm sorry, I would never compliment you again. I promise I won't do it. You know, I mean, it, it's just the reaction. And I think that there's a, a misunderstanding of, of, of those uh, things, because, listen, God wants us to be confident. God wants us to have some confidence in our life. But the difference in confidence and pride is that confidence is knowing who you are in Christ, that you realize that the gift that is in you, the the talents that you have, the abilities that you have, that God gave you those gifts, talents and abilities. But he didn't give you those gifts, talents and abilities to build a name for yourself and for your head to swell up every time that somebody says something nice about you. But he gave you those gifts, talents and abilities to build the kingdom of God. 
And see, here's the problem. If we have the view of humility as we have to be beat down or we have to walk around and we're just that wretched sinner who has no good and we're just worthless and, oh, God, forgive me. And, and you know, then we will never step out and do the things that God has called us to do. Because, I mean, can you just imagine if every Sunday I got up here and preached and I was like, look, guys, I'm just a failure, but God's word says this. And, and you know, I'm, 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 I'm just a sinner saved by grace, too, and just struggling along in life. But this is I mean, nobody would come here and listen to that. Nobody wants to hear that. But to have the confidence and understand that the confidence that I have is not that I am some great speaker. But the confidence that I have is that God has called me to this and that God is placing gifts and abilities in my life to be able to walk in this. And so since God has called me and God has equipped me, then I need to use what God has given me to build his kingdom. And the enemy wants us to think that having confidence in who we are in Christ is pride. And that's not the truth. You see, pride is when you make it all about you. Pride is when you think you're the only person who deserves something. Or you think you're the only person. Like you've got the corner market on, on the goods. And, and, and you know, you're, you're the man of God of power. And you're the anointed worship leader. And, and you're the, the famous artist. And, and, you know, and, and you make it all about that. You see, pride makes the center of attention not God. But it puts all the center of attention on you. And unfortunately, we raise our kids to think that the world evolves around them a lot of times. And we have, we have raised people with that mindset, you know, that it evolves around you. Simple things that we do. A mom cooks a dinner. Little Johnny doesn't like green beans. So little Johnny has to have some rolls and some pizza and everything like that. And so they have to cook a completely different dinner for little Johnny because little Johnny doesn't like green beans and grilled chicken that everybody else in the family is doing. You know what you've done? You made them think that the world evolved around. Oh, look, if my menu is not good enough here, let me cater to you. What do you want, little Johnny? Let me get it for you. Mama's little boy, I love you. I mean, that, that's the way that we raise. And it's no problem in loving our kids and raising our kids and stuff, but they have to realize they're not the center of attention. You know, I remember when uh, uh, me and Melody were first married. Her, her little brother was about seven years old, and and we were in uh, Louisiana at the time, and it was like 4th of July, and we were doing this camp out at her mom's house, and they had a pool outside, and, and we're all in the living room, and, and, and her little brother, like I said, was about seven years old, and, and, and Melody's mom said, hey, Jake, you need to go in there and, and get your swimsuit on. We're going outside. We're going to go swim and, and, and grill out out there. Come on, you need to go change. And, and, you know, the whole family is there, all her sisters and their husbands and some of the kids and stuff. And so there's like 15 or 16 people standing around sitting in the living room. And Jake looks at everybody and says, okay, everybody get out. i got to change. We're like, hold up. <laughs> go to your room or go to the bathroom or something. We're not all leaving because you have to change. You're not the only one that deserves to be in this room. You need to go and, and you know, prefer others is better than yourself. And you go and leave the room instead of kicking everybody else out. But that's what pride does. Is pride thinks that you're the only one that deserves to be in the room. That when it comes to choosing a worship team or a basketball team or a, a team of employees or something, that you are the only one that can fill the position and there is nobody who is able to fill the position like you. And if they fill it with somebody else, then they just made a mistake because you're the one that deserves it. And you see, that's what pride is. Pride makes it all about you. And we're going to look at this and, and, and realize that, you know, pride and, and humility are complete opposites. And we're going to look at the life of Christ and, and take some uh, examples from him. And, and so if you have your Bible, I want you to open the two passages. One of them is uh, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be there. The other one is Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're going to pick up there and, and we're going to look at these two passages. Most of the time, if you can't hold two passages, go, go to Philippians because that's where we're going to be for the most part. And I know some of you Bible scholars out there are like, wait a minute. Jesus was already dead when Philippians and Romans was written. Yes, I know that. But Paul is teaching on humility. And in Philippians, he's talking about the life of Christ. So we are going to look at this and the examples that Paul pulled 
from the life of Christ. He's encouraging the church at Philippi there. And we'll start Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of spirit, any, if there's any affection or compassion, make uh, my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, uni- united in spirit and intent with one purpose. So he starts out this area of his letter and he's telling them, listen, this is important. You need to be united together. You need to be a team with one purpose. You need to be joined together in love. You need to preserve unity. And listen, that type of a church, that type of a family, that type of a work environment is not going to happen if there is not some humility in that group. And so that's why Paul goes on from there and he begins to teach about humility. But I want to pull a couple things from this that we need to understand. One is that humility fights to preserve unity. Humility is not all about you. Humility makes it about others. Humility make, it includes other people in the vision. It allows other people to be in the room. It makes it that other people in this world are valuable and not just you. It realizes that other people have gifts. Other people have talents. Other people have abilities in their life. And it's not just all about you. All, uh, humility also fights for peace. If you look in Romans chapter 12, Paul is writing to the church there and he says, be devoted one to another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. So again, he's talking to him about love. He's talking to him about preferring others. It goes on and says, not lagging behind in diligence, but be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering through tribulation, being devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints. Look at that. It doesn't just say contributing to your needs and what you need. But contributing to the needs of others, looking out for others, helping other people. It goes on and says, in practicing hospitality, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. And I think the problem is, is if you look at the way that most people live their life, we don't rejoice with people that rejoice. And somebody who is not walking in humility or somebody that is walking in pride will not rejoice when somebody else rejoices because they're only looking at what it costs them. So somebody gets a promotion and, and instead of being happy for somebody who just got that promotion, it's like, well, I should have got that promotion. Why didn't I get that promotion? It's not fair that I didn't get that promotion. Come on, how many of your kids, you, you know, one of the kids has been with one parent the other kid may be with another parent and then they find out that, that one of the parents was someplace where, where they, that, you know, that child that was with the mom, you know, got cookies and the child that was with the dad didn't get cookies and they come back together. And of course, the child who got cookies is like, nana, nana, boo, boo, I got cookies and kind of rubbing it in the face and stuff. And then what does the other child always say? Well, that's not fair. Why don't I get cookies? Dad, I need cookies, too. You know what? Not everybody's going to get cookies at the same time. And we have to be happy when other people get cookies. We have to be happy when they rejoice or when they get a promotion. We have to be happy when they succeed. We have to be happy when and, and especially when it comes to like people who have the same giftings. It's fine to to be happy for somebody who got promoted and they got to speak and you're kind of a singer or or be uh, excited for somebody who's a musician and and they get to, you know, kind of step up and begin to step out into things and stuff. As long as they don't take one of your songs that you normally sing. It's easy to do it when it's somebody who's got a different gift, but it's kind of hard when that gift is the same gift that you have. And then you start looking at it and it's like, hold up, wait a second. I deserve that. And that's what he's saying. He's like, look, you don't need to act like that. If somebody else sees something good in their life, you need to be happy with it. And if somebody else sees something bad happen in their life, you don't need to be sitting back and be like, ha, ha, serves them right. If they would have made if they wouldn't have done that, they're just reaping what they sowed. They did me wrong, and now look what's happening to them. It's all blowing up in their face. Ha, ha. Come on, don't look at me all holy. You guys have done that before. Lord, Lord, Lord. 
And we get excited when somebody else is weeping. Paul's saying that's not, that's not humility. That's not what, what we're supposed to have. It says, but be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind and, and associate with the lowly, but do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil. Underline, highlight, circle that word. Do you ever have the right to pay back evil for evil? No. Never do that. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Paul is telling them, walk in humility because humility is going to fight for peace. Humility is not fighting for your right, for your position, for your place. Humility is fighting to preserve the peace because it is better to have peace in your home than to have some type of a position. And the, the sad thing is, is that the reason why that a lot of marriages are struggling and, and, and everything is because you have two people that their parents have raised them to be that, that little Johnny who gets everything that they want. And then they come together and they don't understand why they don't get what they want every time. And so they can't, they can't get along because they're both selfish people and, and they don't get what they want. And so they end up s- splitting and separating and, and they forget about the pain that it causes the kids. They forget about all of the things like that because all they're worried about is, I didn't get what I want. And it's like the kid who's complaining, I didn't get my cookies. It's not fair. But Paul said, you've got you to forget about that. You've got to pursue peace. Sometimes, it will get, pursuing peace means you give up the right to be right in order to pursue peace, in order to preserve peace. You know that the way that that is happening is the wrong way and everything, but you are going to not, you're not going to dig your heels into the ground and die on that battle. That's one thing in marriage is you got to understand there are some things that are important, and you got to hold your guns, and, and you, you had those discussions and things, and then there are some things that just does not matter. And instead of fighting over the things that does not matter, look, I know it's something silly, but if he leaves his socks by that chair every day, and you have told him for 10 years, and he still leaves his socks by that chair, quit, j- just pursue peace. Go get the nose clip, put it on your nose, reach down, pick up the socks and just take them to that. And you know what's going to happen over time? He's going to start realizing she ain't fussing at me about the socks anymore. She I don't want to leave that around there. She's being all nice and stuff. I'm going to I'm going to act right and I'm going to pick up my own stuff. And then he's going to go out of his way to do other things. Look, if we would pursue peace, walk in humility, trust God to work on our behalf. Next, in Philippians, go back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says this. It says, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, uh, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You know, in both of these places, he doesn't just say that you are to prefer other people as your equals. He says to prefer other people as better than yourself. Because if you look at the example of Jesus, isn't that exactly what he did? He didn't sit in heaven and be like, okay, God, no, those people are worthless. Let's just wipe them out and start over. I'm not going down there and dying. I'm not getting spit on and and beaten and and mocked and have my beard plucked out. I'm not going to do that for those people, no. He didn't just look out for what made him feel, but he looked out for the interest of others. And listen, we have got to stop making ourselves the center of, uh, of the world. We have got to stop being self. And if you look, it says it don't do anything in selfishness, but in humility. So it is it is putting the two things as selfishness is the opposite of humility. So if you're a selfish person that you always have to eat where you want to eat or it always has to be done the way that you want it done or, or whatever, or else you're going to get the silent treatment or kind of throw a fit, then you are not walking in humility. And you just need to learn to let some things go. Because it's, it's, it's not worth it. 
Find a way to pursue peace. Treat, treat other people as better than yourself. Look out for the interest of others. Verse 5, it says, Have this attitude in yourself that was in Christ Jesus, whom, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and, and being humble in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so you see here that he, he, he talks about the, the, the mindset that we have is not just to think that you're humble and stuff, but to follow the example and have the same mindset that Jesus had, who Jesus was part of the Trinity. He was part of the Godhead. But he didn't sit, look at himself and look at his life and say, no, I'm not going down. I'm not going to do that. But he humbled himself. And it even said that when he was on earth, the scripture says that he wouldn't do anything unless he saw his father do it. And even when he was praying, he was like, God, if there's any other way, if this cup can pass, then let it pass. But if not, whatever your will is, let your will be done. And when we begin to die to our will and our ambitions and our right to be right and our motives and everything, and we just begin to trust in God and just let his will be done in our life, even if it costs us something, then we have begun to follow the example that Jesus set. And then if you go on to verse 9, it says this. For this reason, because Jesus humbled himself to die. Listen, if you are going to walk in humility, there has to be a death in your life. And the death is to your self-will. And, and that's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Throughout scripture you see where God wants us to die out to our will. And find what his plan for our life is. And even though it may not be our way. Even though it may cost us a relationship. Even though it may cost us a few friends. Even though we may get made fun of. Even though we may get persecuted. Whatever the case is. We are going to do it God's way. And we are going to find God's will for our life. That's why he said that if any man will come after me. He must take up his cross daily. And follow me. Because the person who seeks to save his life is going to lose it. But the person who will lose his life for my name's sake shall be saved. There has to be a death. There has to be a, a death to our will. But if there is a death to our will and our motives and our ambition, it will not be in vain. Because verse 9 says, because Jesus died to his own will. Because he was willing to submit to earthly parents. Because he took on the form of a bondservant. Because of all of that, God highly exalted him. And bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. And that same promise, God gives us that promise in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, young men, submit yourself to the elders. And, and, and likewise, uh, and clothe yourself in humility toward one another. For God is opposed or God resists, or God is fighting against the proud. But he gives grace. That word grace is charis. It is an empowerment to be able to walk holy, to be able to walk righteous, to be able to walk according to his word and fulfill the call of God that is in your life. He gives grace to who? The humble. Verse 6. Therefore, submit yourself before the mighty hand of God. And in due season, what? At the proper time, he will exalt you. See, humility, its end result is promotion and exaltation. And the problem is, is that we live our lives trying to build a name for ourselves, trying to, to you know, fight our way to the top, trying to make sure that we, even to the point of where we will lie or bend the truth or whatever to try to make other people look worse so that we can begin to make ourselves look better. We point out the failures and everything else in everybody else's life while we still got that big plank standing in our life. Because we're trying to build a name for ourselves. We're trying to get promoted. We're trying to get exaltation, but we just saw here in the word of God that, that promotion and exaltation doesn't come 
by the cat fight and the pride and, and trying to prove that you're better than everybody else. That, that exalting comes when you submit before the mighty hand of God and you allow him to bring promotion. See, in Genesis chapter 11, you see this in the Old Testament. You, you got a group of people who God told them, he said, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to spread out and inhabit the earth and, and take dominion over the earth. But this group of people, they didn't, they didn't want to do that. They, they liked the people that they were around. And they, so they said, hey, we got an idea. Let's build a name for ourselves. Hey, let's build a tower so high that it's going to reach into the heavens. And then people will see what we've done and, and we'll build a name for ourselves and, and we'll look awesome and stuff. And, and God will forget his whole plan about us spreading out and populating the earth and all that stuff. Because we're trying to get to God by building this building. And we're just going to do it our way and, and try to exalt and build higher and, and everything. And so they do this. And, and God says he looked down on them and the people were in such unity that he looked at them and he's sitting in heaven and he looks over at Jesus and the Holy Spirit and he says, look, if we don't go down, they are going to achieve this because nothing will be impossible to them because of the unity that they are in. So let us go down and let us confuse their language and let us separate the things that they are doing. And this is a thought that I had is if this group of people who were working against the will of God that God looked down on and said, because of the unity in them, they can accomplish anything. What can happen when a group of people begin to forget about every other name and we begin to realize that God said Jesus' name to be the name that is above every name. And instead of building a name for ourselves, we're going to build a name for Jesus Christ. Instead of building our church and our group of people, it's like we're going to build the kingdom of God. God. We're going to build his church. We're going to invest in other people. We're going to reach out. We're going to lift up. We're not going to tear down and, and make other people look bad and tell people why they shouldn't go to this church and why they shouldn't go to this church. But we are going to realize that we are the body of Christ. We are supposed to be gathered together under one name. And that's the name of Jesus Christ. Not I Heart Church. Not Brandon Holly. Not any other church. Not any other name. But the name of Jesus Christ. And we come under that banner. And instead of trying to build a name to achieve something in ourselves, say, God, this is all about you. If, I don't, if I'm not the one leading that song, I'm cool with it. I'm going to cheer Aaron on. Go, Aaron. You're the man, bro. If I'm not the one getting up and doing tithe and offering, I'm Pastor Jimmy, come on, brother. Good job. If I'm not the one teaching, if I'm not the one playing electric, if I'm not the drummer, if I'm not whatever, we're not worried about what we aren't doing. We're just finding what we are supposed to do. And we're not worried about what our position or our title or anything like that is. We are still only lifting up one name. Our focus is to build up one name. And, and he's the only one that is worthy of a throne. He is the only one that is worthy of any title or anything. And so we make that our focus. Can you imagine what a body of Christ would be able to do when they're in unity and they're doing the will of God. Beckley, West Virginia, West Virginia, the United States, the world is not ready for what can happen if we would die out to our ambition and we would just say, you know what? The goal is more important than the role. If I'm a leader, I'm a leader. If I'm a follower, I'm going to follow the best that I can. If I if I if if whatever is needed to be done, I'm just going to do it because I'm not worried about my position, my title, whatever. Look, when you find that place. You know what's going to happen? God's going to reach down. And the desire of your heart will be right there. I can tell you this from experience. When I was in Louisiana, you know, there was time and time I, I worked for the nonprofit. I was never on staff at the church in West in, in Louisiana. I was never on staff at Healing Place. I was never on staff at the church in Santa Mar. I worked for the nonprofit the whole time. I worked for the Church United Community Development. For, there were times when I was doing demolition. There were times I was cleaning out the nastiest houses and doing eviction. There were times I was cleaning out rat-infested food. Uh, and there were times that I was up, uh, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning teaching a Bible study. There were times when I would be leading worship somewhere. There were times when I would be preaching somewhere. There were times when I was doing children's ministry. There, I mean, it, it was just whatever needed to be done, we were doing. I was cutting grass for the church. I was fixing broken sewer lines for widows. I was just whatever. And you, but there was this part in me, and I, I read my journals from this point in time, and I'm serious. I looked at some of those journals a few months back, and I read this, and I was like, dude, you are the biggest weakling in the world. Grow up. 
Because I was sitting there writing, oh God, when am I ever going to get on staff? This is horrible. Why, why didn't anybody see what I got? The gifts, talents, abilities in me. Why, why did every person that I train, they get promoted? I mean, there was this one point in time where we had, uh, <clears throat> had started a different campus, and we were at that campus, and, and Pastor Mark was traveling a lot. And so when Pastor Mark was traveling, I would kind of fill in and, and, and do all the MCing and speak a little bit and stuff like that. And, and you know, everybody just kind of looked at me as that pastor when Pastor Mark wasn't there, even though I wasn't on staff at the church. And uh, they hired somebody uh, from out of state, and they brought him in, and 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 they uh, and then Pastor Mark was going to Africa, and before he moved, to, uh, before he was going to Africa, he said, "Brandon, I, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to train Pastor David up. I need you to invest in him, teach him how we do things around here. You know, show him what we do, and and all this stuff." And so he was gone for three weeks and traveling at different places and stuff. And so I'm training this training him and stuff, and, and this, you know, Pastor David that was here to speak at the women's conference and everything, and, and you know, the, he comes in, and, and I'm teaching him and trying to set up things and, and all this stuff, and, and then uh, the, when, when Pastor Mark came back, they put Pastor David in the spot that I was doing all that stuff, so the speaking stopped, the, the you know, flow time, prayer time, leading, all that stuff, it stopped because they put him in that position, and you know what? There were thoughts like, wait a minute. I just trained him. I was here first. I had people coming up to me. Brandon, I just don't think it's right. I don't know why they went and hired somebody. I mean, you're here. You're doing it. You're doing a great job. I just don't understand this. And you know what? I had to make up in my mind the decision that the goal is more important than my role. If I begin, if I give in to this and I begin to be like, yeah, I know. I mean, it's messed up. I, I, I don't understand it either. You know, I, I, I don't know. This is wrong. You know what? Those people would have picked up on that offense. And it would have spread through the church and would have quenched what God was trying to do. You know what my answer was? I was like, it's not my position. It's not my place. And Pastor David knew that people were saying that. And so I went to him one day and I said, hey, I want you to understand something. I said, you're my pastor. Whatever you need, I'm here to serve you. Whatever area you need me to serve in, whatever you need me to do, I'm here. This, you're my pastor. Just give me marching orders. Let's do this. Because I understood that humility isn't seeking a position. Humility isn't seeking a title. And see, the more that I become content in just working and just doing accounting and just leading an organization and just doing stuff, then all of a sudden I start feeling like I'm supposed to go to West Virginia and help take care of my grandpa who is, who is sick and stuff. And so I go to Pastor Morgan and said, hey, I need you to help pray that I'll find a job up there because, the, you know, jobs aren't real great. And, you know, and I, I'm, I really don't want to go underground. I don't I just don't want to get into that type of thing. I know I won't be able to get ministry off. So I just need some direction and stuff, will you just pray that God will help find a, a, a job for me? And he came back to me and he said, look, God told me we're not, we're not just praying for a job, look, because you were willing, God told me to tell you, because you were willing to give up uh, your position and everything like that that you have here to go take care of family, that God was going to give you both. He said, we're planting a church. We're behind you. It wasn't something that I sought. I killed that dream. It died. And then when I was content with who I was in Christ and what I was doing, not needing a position, not needing a title, if I have to train every person on staff that ever goes on staff at this church, I'm going to be the best staff trainer that I possibly can be. Even if I never make it on staff. Because it's about building the kingdom of God. And God went, okay, here. Heart's desire has been to be a pastor in West Virginia. There you go. And then you look at what God has done and how he's blessed. Because of humility. Humility gets God's attention. It draws his grace to help you get through everything. It, it, it is the thing that God is looking at. And, and so the, the important thing that we have to realize is, you know, that verse says that he will promote you in proper time. Can I give you the definition of what I feel proper time is? You ready for this? When your heart is ready. Not when your gift is ready. 
Not when you feel you're ready. Not when other people tell you you're ready. Because when God was looking for a king, and, and Samuel is looking at all these men, he's like, surely this guy, Eliab is it. I mean, he's tall, he's big, he, you know, and he's looking at all these things. Nope, 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 nope. And instead, he chose somebody who was a man after God's own heart. He told Samuel, he said, man looks upon the outward appearance. Man looks upon the gifts. Man looks upon the, the pedigree or the family or the, the talent or the ability. But I'm looking at the heart. And that's why it's important that if we're going to be uh, uh, humble, that it starts with, it, it's a condition of the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this. It says, with all diligence or above all else, to watch over your heart with all diligence. For out of it throw the, uh, flow the wellsprings of life. Every issue of life comes out of your heart. And if your heart is impure, if your heart, if there is, is darkness and sin and lack of integrity and everything, all your gifts and talents and abilities would just lead you to a great fall. If the character that is inside of you cannot sustain the gift that is upon you. And that's why you see so many people, even in ministry, that they step out and they start to achieve something and then they fall. And it's because their heart. So it says to guard your heart with all diligence. You know, how many of you heard all this stuff about the Ebola and all that stuff going on? I mean, it, it, it's like all contagious and they, they quarantine and everybody and they got people in Texas and that, that may have contracted it. And, and so now they got all these people in this house and they're keeping them all inside because they don't want it to spread because, you know, the symptoms don't start showing for a few days. And see, that is the thing that, that's so amazing is the symptoms of pride, the symptoms of offense don't always show up right away. But they will show up over time. Just like the Ebola. I'm telling you, offense and pride are like the Ebola to the church. You can't see it at first. But after a while, the symptoms will start coming out. The sarcastic marks will start coming out. The negative statements will start coming out. The lack of effort will start coming out. You know, those things, because you can't contain it because your heart isn't right. And here's the thing, just like Ebola is contagious that everybody comes in contact with, offense is contagious to anybody that it comes in contact with. And that's why you see so many church splits. This person didn't like that they, they got, somebody got promoted over them and they felt like they needed to have that position or they gave, some, they said something and it, it, you know, they didn't go with their thoughts or their efforts and stuff. And so they began to, to go and talk to people and like, Pastor Jimmy, you know, I can't believe that they didn't let me do this. And then Pastor Jimmy starts, you know, listen to it. And it's like, yeah, you know what? That's right. You, that you should have done that. You've been here longer. You, you, you've been at it. And then Pastor Jimmy starts carrying that a little bit. And he talks, talks to Jenny. And she starts kind of picking that up. That's right. I can't believe Pastor Brandon made that decision. They've been here longer. It's the only fair that they should be in that position. And then it starts spreading and filtering to more and more people. And then the next thing you know, something that is deadly to the church has completely spread through the church. And it all started with offense. Listen, we've said it before, but this is something that you have to understand. You've got to have this as part of your mentality and stuff. You refuse to be offended. Because I'm telling you this, if you're around me long enough, I'm going to offend you at some time. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to have the wrong look on my face. I'm going to forget your name. I am going to uh, forget your kid's name. I'm going to forget to text back. I'm going to make some type of mistake because I am only human. And can I tell you something? If you get mad and go to another church, you're going to find another pastor that's just at, at, at the same case as me. That's going to forget your name. That's going to forget when your birthday was. That's going to forget these things. And stuff so because we're only human and we are trying to do the best of our ability, you will never find a perfect church where that's not going to happen. So what do you do? You set up a guard. That word, it says to watch your heart with all diligence. It means to build a garrison around, to put up an armed guard. You know, those houses where they have the people with the Ebola and, and stuff that they actually have armed guard outside of it, making sure that nobody gets in and nobody comes out because it's that deadly. That's the way we have to guard our hearts. 
Brooke, if you want to come on up, we have to realize that offense and that pride and our ambition and things it, are that deadly. In a marriage, always having to be right, it's that deadly to your marriage. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't you rather be wrong and have peace and God still be able to move in your family than have it separated and divided and torn apart and go through that pain? Listen, I know there's people in here, you've been through divorce. I can tell you this, every one of you that's been through a divorce, you'd probably raise your hand and say, I would not want to go through it again. It's painful. It hurts. It doesn't just hurt you. It hurts the kids. It hurts everybody around. It's the same way in the church. People that have been hurt by church and take offense and everything like that, and they carry that with them, and they carry it from one church to the next, and the first time that a pastor says anything that reminds them of their previous church, that's it, I'm gone. And then they keep walking around this, and it's like there's no good churches in town. I'm just going to stay home. I'm just going to watch church on TV. And then they start finding faults with it. And then they don't want anything to do with God because all Christians are just hypocrites. That's the exact thing the enemy wants. That's why the Bible says don't forsake the assembling together of the brethren because it's important. And the devil knows that, so he's going to try to divide, he's going to try to separate, he's going to try to isolate so that he can begin to pounce on you and begin to attack you. Look, there's protection in numbers. There's strength in numbers. But guys, these small groups, these community groups, these things that we're doing, that's so that you can connect on a smaller level and so that you can begin to meet people and begin to develop relationship and everything. But if you don't sign up and you don't go. Well, the church just got too big. I can't believe that. We made a way for it to be smaller. For you to meet people. For you to know people. We can't, I mean, just finding fault. We got to stop that. We got to be united. We walk in humility. We build each other up. We encourage one another. There's no competition in humility. There's no pursuit of position. There's no out, you know, just ambition. Because here's the problem. When you seek a position or a title, you're not following in God's example. Remember, Jesus' example was John chapter 13. He humbles himself. He takes up a towel, the lowest position. He wipes, he washes the disciples' feet. He serves them. Takes the lowest position. If you look at Isaiah chapter 14, you'll see what Satan's position on things is. Chapter 14, go ahead and put it up there. It says this, it says, have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to earth, you have weakened the nations, but you, because you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars, and I will sit on the mount of an assembly. You see, the desire in Satan's heart or Lucifer's heart was exaltation, position, title. I want to be equal. I want what's rightfully mine. I'm beautiful. I'm talented. I need to be in this. I need to be in the position and stuff. And and God, same thing. He resists the proud. But see, here's the problem. It didn't just affect Satan. Lucifer was not the only angel that was cast out of heaven. One third of the angels went with him. You know what that shows me? Just think about this. These are angels who stood in the presence of God. Look, if if there was anybody who was an amazing leader and, you know, did no wrong and, and, and all that stuff, I think God would be it. But yet pride and offense and trying to make a way trying to get to the top led not only to the fall of Lucifer but the fall of one third of the angels another reason why you guard your heart because it's not just about you another reason why you pursue peace you know, because you realize that it's going to affect others in your home husband and wife you fight and you can't get along you find a way to pursue peace 
because it's going to affect your children. It's going to affect your grandchildren. They're going to see that. You're sending samples. People that are, are not Christians are looking at you, and you're supposed to set a godly example, and they're looking for a godly example of what a home should look like, and your home looks the same as theirs. In a workplace, you get passed up for a promotion, so I'm just not going to try. I'm not, I'm not going to work hard. I don't know why it does me any good. I mean, I'll, I'll work my tail off, and then they get promoted, and they're late all the time and all that, and here I am getting passed over. This ain't right. I'm just going to come, and I'm just going to do the merit minimum. I'm not going to do all that overtime anymore. I'm not going to work as unto the Lord. You're not hurting that boss. You're hurting you. Because then the Bible says that in everything you do, in word and action and deed, do it wholeheartedly unto the Lord. And so when you stop working hard and you stop showing up on time, guess what? You're the one that is in disobedience to the word of God. If you would just stay humble and you will serve hard and you will work hard, God will bring promotion. He's just waiting on you to be able to rejoice with those that rejoice. Instead of weeping when somebody else rejoices. See, humility is the glue that holds family together. Humility is the glue that holds your church together. Humility is the glue that, that sh- I mean, it's the, it's the thing that makes us different, that people in, in a dark place can see the light in us. That we still work hard, we still do that. There could be somebody in your office that if you would continue to work hard and stuff, they know that you should have got that promotion, but you still work hard and everything. They're going to be like, I don't know how in the world you can do that. That's because what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. And it may open the opportunity to lead them to the Lord. You never know. You never know who's watching. So that's why daily we clothe ourselves in humility. And we walk in it. So that we can continue to build his kingdom. Amen.